And we've also concealed the identities of several of the young people. Here's WIS photojournalist Brian Caldwell tonight. No, what's going on? But this tour right here is geared up to get your attention, to show you what can take place if you go down the wrong road. All right, come around this way. One of our max units, and when I say max unit, normally the individuals in this unit of violent offenders. I've probably been in this jail the longest five years. Staying in school, staying away from the negative people. Do not for one minute think that what I'm telling you is BS because it's not. It's the truth. But if anything that you learn from here, learn to don't get in trouble. Respect your parents and teachers. And if you can't, if you can't do something, you find yourself with a problem, talk to somebody who can help you. Uh, you know, uniform is a female dorm. And I know y'all saying, when I get grown, I'm going to do what I want to do. But when you come here, you're going to do what they tell you to do. You're going to go to bed, what time to tell you to do. You're going to get up, you're going to wash, you're going to eat what they give you to eat. And then we're going to go to x-ray. And this is a dorm that's vacant, so you can see the inside of a cell. At this time, I want you to go inside that room, look at that room, and then tell me what's missing. Go inside. Don't be scared. Go inside. Nobody's going to close the door on you. Come on. In lockup, they lock down 23 hours out of 24. The only thing you get in while you're in lockup, you get a shower every other day, you get an hour wreck. You use the phone only on Thursdays. And I hope this tour has done something, and I hope you keep it in the back of your head. So when you do see yourself going left instead of right, you think about this place. I hope my face, Officer Stalin's face and some of the people you see, I hope that face is an image and it comes back to you and say, oh, no, I don't want to go there. Photojournalist Brian Caldwell there, that program. Taking Hannah as she comes on shore, strong winds. This is the ocean that's come all the way down this street. Actually already cleared one street over here to my left. The winds are coming on right now, very strong. It's something that a lot of people said they weren't too concerned about. In fact, this gentleman was actually inside of the water, standing in waist deep. He said he was just in there because he said he didn't have any worries about the storm. He just wanted to see and feel what the hurricane was like. Never seen the hurricane before. Tropical storm close enough. They tell me they'll close the bridge at 50 mile an hour winds. And we're on the opposite side of the main road, so I just, I hate to see all this. They tell me they'll close the bridge at 50 mile an hour winds. As long as we don't hit 50, I feel all right. If I start seeing everybody go that way, I'm going with them. He literally bit. And you can feel it underneath where he's bit right straight through here. I'm going to tell you, it's not a lizard, man. What you've got is a primate, mm -hmm. okay? It's a thing called the swamp ape. We just got on film ourselves when, in, when we are in Texas. These are bulked up creatures, okay? Because of the terrain that they're traveling and traversing, and, the, and their appetite's a little bit bigger than down here in the swamps. I gave it to the cryptozoologists. They came back and confirmed it. That is not a man in a monkey suit. It's the real deal. It's a species that has been undiscovered at this point in time. See how it's climbing now? See him? You can see that figure in there? <laughs> this is the thing that we use. It's infrared, all right, that runs 24-7. We've had them here, stationed here at, at uh, Dixie's house and Bob's. And we had it out there at Skateboard Swamp. Everybody on my team's equipped with night vision gear. The boys had gone out there. Last night we used the NVGs. See, up to 300 feet. We used the thermal images. This will tell us what we can't see with the night vision. We use the heat seekers. So once it hits it, it brings it back the signal to us, let us know something's out there. These are casts that we pulled out of Paris, Texas. You can see the indentation of its heel of the impression that went in the ground. These are not flat pieces of plywood, okay, that was put together with a piece of uh, a jigsaw cutting them out or taking the toes and, and screwing them into the top of the pad of the foot, which we've debunked here of the 88 creature that was out. People all think there's only one of these things, okay? It's not. There's over 3,500 throughout this entire United States, just known by different names. If I was going to die here, I was going to put up a fight, and that's basically what I did.
For Samson Parker, it could have all ended here, near burnt grass on his Kershaw County farm, where Parker noticed a corn stalk stuck in this old rusty picker. I went up with my hand and the rollers that take the shucks off the corn. I uh, had grabbed, grabbed a glove and pulled my hand up into the rollers. The more I tried to pull my hand out, the further up in the rollers that it continued to go. On his knees, his hand stuck in the picker, Parker tried yelling out for help. No one answered. Would have probably have passed out and probably would have bled to death before somebody would have got here. An hour passes, Parker's hand goes numb, and he can't wait any longer. With this rod, he's able to jam the machine. Then Parker reaches in his pants. This is a John Deere pocket knife that I had, and I was actually cutting away the uh, my fingers that was up in there like this. But before he can cut himself free, rod and machine start to spark. It was almost like a gasoline fire. I mean, it just all of a sudden went woof. His right hand still stuck in the machine. Parker now uses his left to fight the spreading grass fire around him. My skin was melting. I mean, it was just dripping off my arm like plastic, melting, melting plastic. So then I realized I was in trouble. And he was desperate. So Parker reached back in his pocket and grabbed his knife. And I just jammed it into my arm. I mean, this, this, just like that, um, just, just started cutting the meat away from the bone. And once I cut all the, the meat off the bone, and I, I just dropped. His right arm now cut off, his body badly burnt. Parker drives to the road in front of his home. A firefighter from the town of Kershaw passes by. My biggest fear was this guy's going to die on me right here, and there's not anything else I can do other than what I've done. What Doug Spinks did was pull over, wrap Parker's arm, and call for help. I'm thankful I was there. So is Parker, crediting Spinks with saving his life. You still see some of the, the blood splattered marks where it burnt. Back on his farm, the idle corn picker still sits. But Parker is moving on, and he says he isn't upset with anyone or anything. He came down and had a, a prayer with, uh, with God and the corn picker and me, and, and we just kind of made it easy, you know, just, just made peace with it and just thankful to be alive and to be here and uh, do an interview with you. So. <laughs> In Kershaw County, Dan Torgman, WIS News 10. My name's uh, Mr. Melvin. I'll be here for the next next few days. Uh, Miss Austin, here. everybody did that homework assignment? Take it out. Carlos exclaimed, Look at that huge pumpkin. Oh, who else wants to be in this group? Right here, come on up. Miss Benjamin? Here. I'm going to leave y'all alone, but when I come back, here in about five minutes, I want, I want, I, we're going to need to hear a plan of some sort. You remember what legitimate means? What, is, what does it mean? Huh? Responsible? Oh, no, no. No, no, not responsible. Where's your homework? You didn't write it down. We knew teaching at John Ford Middle would be challenging, and we thought we knew why. Poverty. In the cafeteria, we noticed nearly every student punches a code to get free or reduced breakfast and lunch. 89% of these students live in poverty. Research has shown, and most experts agree, poverty and the problems associated with it interfere with learning. We thought perhaps that's the reason the school has struggled to achieve for so long. Since the state started grading schools in 2003, John Ford has been either below average or unsatisfactory, and they've never met what's called adequate yearly progress. I do not believe in making excuses for not having good test scores. During the 45 minutes we talked to Principal Huey Peterson, he never uttered the word poverty. I didn't use the word poverty, and I will not use it because I don't want my kids to cop out. I don't want them to use that as a cop out. I don't want it, them to use it as an excuse. I came from poverty myself. So, if it's not poverty, what's happening at John Ford? While I was only in the classroom for four days, it didn't take long to figure out one problem. Teachers have to do lots of things besides teach. Capitalize the R and Robert. Resolving cafeteria crises before school. You get up and you get up. Oh, the two of you, just, just get on up. Seriously, y'all come on. Y'all come on. Make it, make it easy on this my first day patrolling halls during. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Faculty meetings after school. We just received 100 new student debts. Prepping for special projects, grading papers. For first? Laborious lesson plans for each of my three classes. I'm, well, I'm doing lesson plans for Tuesday. So 6.1, oh, no, six. Six dash one point. 
to... My elaborate plans have to be put into the system because someone reviews them and provides feedback. Allegedly, Stephanie Tyler and Jennifer Sashro teach sixth grade English language arts. Do you get feedback commensurate with the amount of, of time that you put into the lesson plans? <laughs> no. no. We don't think about it like no, maybe we did before. He asked me yesterday, why do I do it? You know, I just do what's just fast. Me. We just do what people tell us to do when it comes to that kind of thing. Paperwork doesn't stop with the plans. All right, that's for one day. Teachers have individual academic plans for the students who score below basic on the PAC test individual education plans for students with special needs. They also have this, 272 pages of curriculum, supplements, resources, and standards. It's supposed to make sure they're covering everything. This is their Bible. But the disciples say, enough already. I love teaching. I love it with all my heart. But the paperwork, I can do without. It's about accountability. It is necessary. Christia Murdoch defends the system because for her, paperwork means accountability. The State Department of Education sent Murdoch to help improve achievement at John Ford. I am a teacher, but I'm also a parent. And it is important for me to know that someone is being held accountable for my child's education. Is there too much accountability? No. Absolutely not. Murdoch's boss disagrees. Have we taken accountability too far in South Carolina? We have. We State Superintendent of Education yeah. Jim Rex. Uh, the only purpose for accountability is improvement. And uh, we're, we're doing some things now that don't really lead directly to classroom or teaching improvement. Things like? Well, we're doing a lot of end of the year tests, what we call PAC tests. PAC scores are used to gauge how much students have learned throughout the year. The scores also have the greatest effect on school report cards. PAC scores are perennially low at John Ford. In 2003, 54% of sixth graders scored below basic on the English part of the PAC. Since then, scores have not improved much. Page 22, word roots, prefixes. So many students have struggled on the test, the state pays for this after school program. Shh. Oh, it's time to go. You're welcome. And what do we know about anti? Against. Against, right? Problem is. It's just very just general. Yeah, it's very general. While packed results tell you if students are behind in English language arts, they do not tell you in which specific area. It didn't make much sense to me either. I mean, if a kid's done fine with inference, cause and effect, and drawing conclusions, then it would seem to me that you wouldn't want to spend a whole lot more, a whole lot of time on that. You'd want to devote the time but you, to... But you have a whole class, you got to reach everyone. That was the greatest of my frustrations. Reaching all students is tough because naturally, some get certain things more quickly than others. That was a, an excellent explanation, Abigail. That was a complete sentence. There was a time when grade levels were broken up into classes based on ability. Principal Peterson remembers those days fondly. We can go back to ability grouping. Very easy. That's one way to solve the problem. The problem with ability grouping is that you can predict in advance with pretty high probability who's going to end up in those different groups, but it's based upon socioeconomic race and other things. I think you need to decide, though. I mean, are you worried about getting an education? Are you worried about a stigma? A system confused over how best to make sure students are learning is part of the problem. The other part, students, who don't always seem to want to learn. It says, draw a picture of the vines. See what I'm saying? I want you to, 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 to do it again. You got 20 minutes. No, no, I'm, no, you, you won't, no, you're not, we're going to start over. 